Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today we have Lindsay Boyd. Uh, she is a technologist in the Pulse area at Serials Canada, uh, and she conducts research on pulse milling and the development of commercially ready pulse ingredients as part of a multi year uh, project funded by the Pulse Science Cluster. Uh, her work includes evaluating the quality of pulse flowers and the utilization in food applications. Uh, prior to taking this role in 2019, Lindsay worked as a technician in analytical services and the Pulse, especially crops department. Uh, Lindsay has a BSc in food science and a master's of food science at the University of Manitoba. Despite wanting to come to Saskatchewan to do mm -hmm. her study, she went to Manitoba. That's okay, we won't uh, hold it against her. Uh, but yeah, we're really excited to have Lindsay here today and uh, to learn more about the uh, the benefits of pulse flowers and uh, milling capabilities. So. Um, all right, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here today. I will be uh, discussing pulse milling with a specific focus on roller milling and the opportunities to create a variety of different pulse flower ingredients. I'll also discuss some pre and post treatments that could be used to modify pulse flower functionality and their use in end products. So just some quick background, Canada is one of the largest producers and exporters of pulses in the world. About 85% of our pulse crops produced here are exported to over 120 different countries. Uh, the demand for pulses has been growing for the past number of years, uh, primarily driven by the plant-based protein trend, uh, sustainability as they fixed nitrogen, so they, that reduces uh, the fertilization needs to grow pulse uh, crops, and also they're gluten-free, making them a nutritionally dense ingredient to include in gluten-free foods. Some statistics from Euromonitor Inter International, which is based on U.S. data, show that uh, the pet food, rice, pasta, noodles, and savory snack categories will account for more than 60% of pulse flower growth in the next three years, and uh, chickpea and lentil flour will experience the greatest growth. So pulse is uh, a term used for the edible uh, seeds of legume plants. In Canada, we typically grow peas, lentils, chickpeas, and dry beans. Uh, we also have been uh, growing uh, fava beans quite a bit in recent years as well. Uh, soybeans or other oil seeds, despite being legumes, uh, are not considered pulses because of their high oil content. In Canada, we grow pulses typically in the prairie provinces, with Saskatchewan producing the majority of pulse crops, um, and the majority of beans are grown in southwestern or southeastern uh, Ontario. So today my presentation will be uh, divided into four sections. Uh, first, I'll compare some milling technologies that can be used for pulse flowers. Uh, then we'll get into a little bit more detail with roller milling and exploring some pretreatments to improve hull separation during the milling process and uh, then look at pre and post treatments to modify pulse flower functionality. So first let's compare some milling technologies. There's many different pulse mills or mills that can be used to grind pulses into flour. Uh, the first on the left is a stone mill. Uh, then we have a hammer mill, pin mill, furcar mill or a knife mill. And uh, this is a photo of the lab size roller mill uh, that we use here at Cereals Canada. Uh, all of these mills will produce different types of flour, or flour with different characteristics and properties. Uh, particle size distribution will be one that will be primarily affected by the mill type. Um, the mills shown on this slide, except for the roller mill, are what we would consider single stage mills. So what that means is uh, the seed goes into the mill, gets ground down into flour, and only one flour is produced from those mills. Con uh, conversely, the uh, lab roller mill or any roller mill is a gradual uh, reduction mill. So that means that there's a series of milling passages, a series of rolls that gradually reduce the pulse seed down into flour. 
So just to explain roller milling a little bit further, this is a flow diagram of our lab mill. Uh, so this is a little bit more simplistic of a system than you would see in a commercial mill or even our pilot scale roller mill here at Cereals Canada, uh, but the concept is the same. So our lab mill has three break rolls, uh, which is depicted on the left here, and three uh, reduction rolls. And so the seed will flow into the first break roll first, and then there's a series of sieves. So depending on the granulation of that material, it will direct to wherever it goes next. So it might go into the next break passage, it might go over to the middling side, of uh, or the reduction side of the mill, or it might get collected as a flower. So through the series of roll passages and sieves, we will collect six different flowers. So three break flowers and three middling flowers. There'll also be uh, hulls or bran as uh, uh, sh and shorts as uh, byproducts. Um, you may hear me uh, refer to a straight grade flower throughout this presentation. And what that means is it's a blend of all of these, each individual flower stream. So three break flowers plus three middling flowers is what uh, makes up a straight grade flower, which is a primary product from the roller mill. Uh, so you can see by obtaining these different flower streams, uh, you might have a little bit more variety of what type of ingredient you might be able to produce from this type of mill. So before I get into uh, some of the milling comparison data, I just wanted to touch on seed hardness. Cur currently, there's no approved method to measure seed hardness in pulses. Seed hardness will have an impact on how the seed mills and can potentially impact flower properties. Uh, characteristics like uh, starch damage and particle size can be impacted by seed hardness. So we wanted to investigate if we could adapt the particle size index method, which is typically used for wheat, uh, for pulses. So for those of you who don't know, um, pulse, uh, Pulse seed, or the particle size index method is uh, done by grinding down wheat and then passing it through a specific size sieve and measuring how much of that ground wheat uh, can pass through the sieve. So more that get, more material that passes through the sieve uh, will result in a higher particle size index and a, means that it's a softer seed. Um, so for pulses, we evaluated four different pulse types, green lentil, yellow pea, kabuli chickpea, and navy bean. These are all variety specific seed over two different years and just tried to see if there, we could get any discrimination between the pulse types for uh, particle size index and if there, if there was any, uh, if this was a good method to measure it. So we found we could get um, some differences between the different pulse types, and green lentil was the hardest, whereas chickpea was the softest. Uh, so this method uh, could be used. However, I we really need to do more research and establish um, these ranges better with more samples. So we need more pulse types, more varieties, and grown in different locations and years um, to really establish these ranges and see what's expected for each pulse type. So to compare the different milling method methods, we focused on comparing the fur car mill to the roller mill, and we use those same four pulse types uh, to uh, evaluate them. So first we looked at pulse uh, or protein content. So uh, for each pulse type, the roller milled flower, and this is a straight grade flower, uh, all had higher protein contents than the fur car milled flower. This indicates that the roller mill did a, a good job of separating out the hull during the milling process because we used whole seed and not dehulled seed. So this lower protein content we see in the uh, fur car milled flowers is really because hulls don't contain a lot of protein, so we're seeing a dilution effect uh, of the protein content in those flowers. So for particle size distribution, uh, the difference was quite large. So you can see that for each of the fur car milled flowers for green lentil, which is the red line, yellow pea and navy bean, 
the distribution between or the particle size distribution is quite wide. Uh, the curve has a wide distribution, meaning that the particle size is uh, quite inconsistent and it's less uniform than what we're seeing with the flower from the roller mill. Um, there's also more large particles uh, in the uh, fur car milled flowers, and this is likely due to the presence of hulls as those are hard to break down in the milling process. The difference was uh, difference was seen in this trend with Kabuli chickpea, where we actually saw a more uniform, more consistent flower in the fur car milled flower compared to the roller mill flower. Um, this is partially because it is a softer seed. Um, and also the hull is very tightly adhered to the uh, cotyledon in Kabuli chickpeas, which makes it hard for it to be separated out. Uh, we also saw difference in starch damage. Uh, the rolling mill flowers had higher amounts of starch damage than the fur car mill flowers. Um, but overall, these starch damage values are quite low if you compare them to, say, what we would expect for wheat, where we would expect something like 8%. Uh, the highest amount of starch damage we see here is about 2.8%. Um, also, the uh, starch damage for green lentil and yellow pea is higher uh, than kabuli chickpea and navy bean. Uh, this could be because of uh, its higher seed or, or its harder seed. Um, texture. So just to summarize this activity, uh, Kabuli chickpeas had the softest texture while green lentils were the hardest. Uh, roller milling produced flowers with more consistent and uniform particle size distribution for the most part. And fur, fur car build flowers were lower in protein content and starch damage. Uh, the lower protein content in the fur card milled flowers was due to the presence of hulls. So next, let's explore some pretreatments prior to roller milling that can try and help improve that hull separation. So we wanted to investigate if we could um, optimize the roller milling process just a little bit more. So we looked at uh, pretreatments of moisture addition and scouring. Uh, we used levels of 0%, 0, 0 0.5%, and 1% moisture addition. Um, the reason why these levels uh, might seem low is because we didn't want to change the moisture content of the seed. We really just wanted to soften the hull um, and make it a little bit more pliable so that it would stay more intact when it breaks off of the cotyledon and make it easier to separate during the roller milling process. Um, scouring, for those of you who don't know, is a light abrasion method. Um, this is typically done uh, in the wheat milling process, so it would be a simple thing to be added on uh, to uh, prior to uh, roller milling pulses as well. So we did a combination of all of these moisture additions with moisture addition levels with and without scouring on a lab mill level um, before we scaled up to a pilot mill level. So we found that scouring was quite successful in uh, aiding in hull separation for three of the four, four pulse types. Uh, it was less effective on chickpeas uh, because as I mentioned, that hull is tightly adhered. So these are some photos of the navy beans and green lentils before and after scouring. So um, on the left left hand side is the whole navy bean before scouring. Then after scouring, you can see there's little hull left on the seed, um, and then there's the hulls that were separated out from the scourer. And same thing with the green lentils. So as I mentioned, we did scale up to our pilot roller mill. We selected one condition, uh, so one pretreatment condition to scale up. For green lentil, we used 1% moisture addition with scouring. For yellow pea, we used 0.5% moisture addition with scouring. And for chickpea and navy bean, we used 0% moisture addition with scouring. Um, we kept the scouring for chickpea, uh, even though it was less effective uh, because there was still some hulls that came off during the scouring procedure, uh, which 
is beneficial because there's less hulls going into the mill that need to get separated out at that stage. So this is a photo of our pilot mill. It's much larger and has more milling passages than the lab mill. Uh, there's 11 milling passages. For green lentil and yellow pea, we adjusted this mill to only have five passes, whereas for needy bean and chickpea, we used all 11. The reason why we did this was because it was the first time we had ever milled navy bean and chickpea on our pilot mill. So we really needed a kind of a starting point uh, to, to go off of for further optimization. Um, all of the pulses milled very well on the uh, pilot mill. The biggest challenge was with chickpea. Uh, the larger seed size uh, made it bounce a little bit on the first break roll. So in future trials, we would need to uh, pre-break the chickpea seed so that it wouldn't uh, bounce on the rolls as much and flow better into the mill. So as I mentioned, we can collect flower streams from each milling pass. So each of these, um, at the bottom here where it says B1, B2, B3, each of those are from a milling passage. So for green lentil and yellow pea, we had five milling passes. So we had B1, B2, 1M, 2M, 3M, 4M. And then for kabuli chickpea and navy bean, we had all 11. So all, all of the 11 streams are present here. Um, you can see that the protein content varied between each stream for all of the pulse types. Uh, for green lentil and yellow pea, the uh, lowest protein content was in the B1-B2 stream and the highest was in the 4M stream. The, for chickpea, the lowest was again in the B1-B2 stream and the highest was in the LG stream. And then for navy bean, the lowest was in the 2Q stream and the highest was in the 4M stream. So these results indicate that there is a gradient of protein content within the seed with the most protein rich material concentrated on the outside of the seed and the more starchy material uh, or the less protein rich material or is more towards the center of the seed. So this shows that there's an opportunity to create blends of different streams that could potentially target a specific protein level of flour. However, you still you do need to uh, consider the yield of each stream. They're not all equal, um, and some of the higher protein streams or lower protein streams might have a lower yield that isn't feasible to produce just that singular stream as an ingredient. So this table shows the yields of all the individual flower streams. The ones in blue are the lower protein content streams. And just to pull out an example, the 4M stream, which was some of the highest uh, protein containing streams for each pulse type, have quite low yielding for green lentil, yellow pea, and chickpea. So that means that to use that stream effectively, we would have to blend it with other higher, contain higher protein containing streams uh, to be able to produce a, an ingredient for industry to use. So we looked at other compositional components as well for each stream. So starch content, as you would expect, has an inverse relationship with protein content. This is showing just for green lentil and navy bean, but this, these trends were also true for uh, yellow pea and chickpea. So uh, lower starch content with the streams that have higher protein content, and then also ash content, those streams that had higher ash content also had higher protein content. Um, I also wanted to point out that we measured color as well of each of these streams. And the, the color of the flower streams seemed related to the protein and ash content as the streams with higher protein and ash content tended to be more yellow and more red in color. So they had a higher A star and B star value. So as I mentioned, we needed to create blends to create different ingredients. So we blended together to make a straight grade flour. So that's all of the flour streams together. 
we created a reconstituted whole flower. So we took the hulls and the shorts that were byproducts from the roller mill, milled them to a smaller uh, particle size, and then added them back into the straight grape flower to create a whole flower. We uh, also then made a low protein and high protein blend um, by selecting the lower protein containing streams and the higher protein containing streams and blending them together. Then we used a, a Furcar milled flour uh, just as a reference point uh, in the study. So the protein content of each of these flours uh, followed kind of similar trends to what I have had mentioned before, where the straight grade flour was higher than the Furcar flours and the reconstituted whole flours, uh, which is to be expected because of the presence of hulls in those two flours. Um, the protein difference between the low protein blends and the high protein blends uh, really depended on the pulse type. Uh, green lentil, there was less of a difference with only about 2%, whereas navy bean, we saw about a 4% difference between those two flowers. So we looked at some of the functional properties of these flowers. Uh, for water hydration capacity, the fur caramel flowers, as well as the reconstituted whole flowers, had a uh, higher water hydration capacity. And the straight grade, low protein, and high protein flowers, there was not much difference between them for all of the pulse types, except for chickpea, where we saw a slight reduction in water hydration capacity. For starch damage, there seemed like there was differences, but there seemed like it was more related to starch content. So the uh, the ones that had higher starch content had start higher starch damage. Um, and we saw the same trend where yellow pea and green lentil overall had higher starch damage values than chickpea and navy bean. The particle size distribution varied quite a bit um, between these five flower blends. So the furcar, which is the green line, and then the reconstituted whole, which is the bright blue line, uh, had quite a wide span, a wide distribution, and had more large particles um, with, because of the presence of, presence of hull. And that was true for green lentil and navy bean, as you can see here. And uh, the straight grade, low, uh, straight grade flour, low protein and high protein flours uh, really had similar particle size distributions and were just slightly different. The same uh, trends that I just mentioned were true of yellow pea, but again, chickpea was a little bit different where you saw the fur car being the most consistent and the finest, uh, whereas the other flowers uh, were more similar in distribution. But again, you still see this uh, increase in large particles in the reconstituted whole flower due to the hulls getting added back in. So we took all of those uh, flowers and added them into a couple of end product applications to see how they functioned. So the first we did was pan bread. So here's the photos of each of uh, each of the breads from each pulse type made with each uh, flour ingredient. So we used a 20% pulse flour inclusion. Um, and just for your background knowledge, compared to 100% wheat breads, so when I say that, I mean like a loaf of white bread, not a whole wheat loaf of bread. Uh, pulp, pulp breads with pulse flowers typically have a lower loaf volume and have a darker, more creamy crumb, crumb color. So that's some of these crumb colors are to be expected, but maybe bean really jumps off uh, the screen with its brighter, whiter crumb compared to some of the other pulse types. Uh, chickpea also, uh, chickpea as well as navy bean have very good low volumes, you can see they're quite high compared to green lentil and especially compared to yellow pea. So comparing these individual ingredients within pulse types, you can see that the dark hulls of the green lentil flower really have an impact on crumb color uh, for the fur caramel uh, flower as well as the reconstituted whole flower. Um, 
And then comparing straight grade, low, grade, low protein and high protein flours, there wasn't a ton of difference between the bread qualities of these flours and all of them, except for the yellow pea, uh, had fairly good flavors as well. So we also incorporated these into spaghetti. Uh, these are photos of dried spaghetti. So generally, uh, pulse, spaghetti with pulse flour included has a shorter cooking time, higher cooking loss, and is darker and more red in color compared to 100% Durham semolina pasta. Uh, so you can see, again, the color effect on the fur car uh, milled flour sample, as well as the reconstituted whole flour for green lentil. It really looks more like a whole wheat pasta than 100% uh, Durham semolina. Um, you can also see with the chickpea, uh, for fur car and reconstituted oil, as well as the yellow pea reconstituted sample, there's some white spots. Um, so for the chickpea, these white spots are underhydrated spots. Uh, so the flour isn't getting equally uh, hydrated when we're mixing it. This could be due to the presence of the hull in those flours. Um, and then we also have some checking starting on in this sample with the yellow pea. Uh, which um, is also a defect for spaghetti. Uh, so overall, this straight grade low protein, protein and high protein flours uh, produce the best spaghetti with not huge amounts of differences between all of them. You'll notice that navy bean is not on this slide. We had a lot of challenges processing um, navy bean in this activity. Um, the, the checking that you see in that yellow pea sample uh, occurred in uh, a severe way in the navy bean samples, so we were unable to analyze them. So just to summarize this, uh, this activity, roller milling was successful in separating the hulls and produced good quality flower streams with different compositions and function functionalities, and scouring improved hull separation. Um, even though it was less, less effective for chickpea. Um, the pulse flour ingredients were, uh, were used in bread and spaghetti and they affected the quality differently. And finally, the roller, roller milling provides an opportunity to create uh, consistent and customized ingredients uh, depending on what application that you want to use them for. So the next activity was exploring pretreatments prior to roller milling, but we're looking at uh, roasting, micronization, and germination treatments. So these treatments are really changing the functionality of the flour rather than using it as a, uh, a milling pretreatment to improve hull separation like I just talked about. So uh, we did th this for the same pulse types that we've been using. Uh, green lentil, yellow pea, chickpea, and navy bean. Uh, we looked at roasting. We tempered the seeds to 30% moisture and uh, roasted them in a convection oven at 160 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. The micronization treatment was tempered, the seed, for the micronization treatment, the seeds were tempered to 20% moisture and then uh, micronized at 140 degrees Celsius. And for germination, uh, the seeds were germinated for 48 hours. You'll notice that navy bean is not included in the germination treatment uh, as there was a kind of a microbial slime that got produced during that germination uh, treatment, which made it not able to be milled. Um, these treatments were selected from some of the work that uh, Mike Nickerson's lab did initially. They did a bunch of different conditions, and these ones were pulled out as the best ones to do scale-up uh, studies on at our facility. So um, on this slide, uh, it's looking at the protein difference between each of the roller milled flour streams. So recall in the previous uh, activity, I showed that the 
uh, protein contents of each individual flower stream uh, ranges. And so this is showing the difference from the highest protein content stream to the lowest. So for example, yellow pea for untreated, uh, there was a difference of 10.9% protein from the highest uh, protein stream to the lowest. But then when we go to some of the other treatments like micronization, the difference diminished. So there was only a difference of 1.9% protein between the highest protein content stream and the lowest. Um, and this was true for all of the pulse types. And you'll also see some changes in the roasting and germinated treatments, but, the, but less so. Um, micronization really changed uh, the protein distribution. So the reason why I'm pointing this out is because if your goal was to create a targeted protein content stream but from, or, or ingredient from uh, the roller milled streams, it might be challenging once you start applying some of these pretreatments because you're getting less variation. Um, I'm not sure exactly why this happened. However, it's likely due to some changes in seed hardness or changes in the way that the seed is fracturing during milling, causing the protein to distribute into the uh, differently. So looking at starch damage, um, micronization had a large impact on starch damage. So for the next couple of slides, these are all looking at the straight grade flowers from the roller mill. So you can see that for each pulse type, the micronization treatment really increased the amount of starch damage. We saw a slight decrease in starch damage for the uh, yellow pea and green lentil roasted flowers. And we also saw a decrease in the germinated uh, flowers for starch damage. Uh, these changes could be the result of changes in seed hardness. I think this large increase in micronization is due to the heat treatment. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, likely some changes in, in the seed hardness. Um, so then water hydration capacity also affected, you know, again, see a large increase in water hydration capacity in the micronized flowers, likely due to that uh, increase in starch damage. We also saw an increase in the roasted and germinated flowers for water hydration capacity. Uh, these are the starch pasting profiles of the chickpea and navy bean uh, flowers. So you can see that the roasted and micronized flowers for both of these pulse types, uh, their starch pasting profile is quite different than the untreated. Uh, they have lower peak viscosities as well as lower final viscosities. And even the navy bean micronized uh, flour has a little bit of a cold pasting viscosity at the beginning of its curve, um, which is likely due to the starch pasting or, or the starch damage in that flour. Uh, now looking at the particle size distribution of these flours, um, we saw that the micronized flours produced a uh, a narrower distribution, so much more consistent uh, particle size flower, where you can see that it's all of these are a single peak for the most part, whereas we see some of these are of some of the other ones like untreated and germinated are more broad and maybe more bimodal. So we also incorporated these into end products. So again, we looked at pan bread. Um, you can see right off the bat that the roasted and micronized for all of the pulse types uh, have a lower low, low volume, as well as a darker, more creamy colored um, crumb. And especially for the micronized, you see a large open round cell structure in the crumb, especially for the yellow pea sample. Uh, the germinated samples performed very well in this application. Uh, you can see that the low volume is quite well, quite good and comparable to the untreated. It has a good crumb structure. Uh, and our bakers really liked working with these flowers. They had really good dough handling properly properties. However, when we tasted them, they were not good. Uh, they had very strong uh, grassy and some bitter flavors. 
that came through, um, which was disappointing. So the for the even though they look very good, um, the germinated flowers didn't perform well in, or would not be uh, acceptable in this application of pan bread. Um, the flavor components for the micronized and roasted samples were better, especially the roasted. They had some nutty type flavors and some of them were less bitter. Um, however, micronized samples would not be good in this application either, just because of its low, low volume and poor crumb structure. So again, we used uh, them in spaghetti as well. Um, the significant change uh, in color for the roasted and micronized samples for majority of the um, pulse types compared to untreated was uh, really a surprise. Typically when you heat treat a flower, you're expecting it to produce a darker or more red color product. Um, and that really wasn't the case here when we looked at the dried spaghetti color, you can really see it in the chickpea pasta. Um, the micronized samples uh, also had a very high cooking loss and a very low cooked firmness. Um, they really uh, were had a poor eating quality because of the firmness. It was mushy and the strands stuck together. This is likely because of that high starch damage. Um, so uh, the micronized flowers really didn't perform well in this spaghetti application either. The germinated flowers, uh, they look very comparable to uh, the untreated, uh, and they performed well in processing as, as in, for this application as well. Uh, when we tried them, the eating texture was quite good. Um, they were slightly less firm, which made them uh, more desirable. Flavor-wise, the green lentil and yellow pea uh, were better and more uh, acceptable than the untreated, and they were actually the most preferred sample rather than uh, while the chickpea still had some bad flavors associated with it. So this was interesting because the green lentil and yellow pea performed well in the, or the germinated green lentil and yellow pea performed well in the spaghetti application, but not in the uh, bread application. So it's really showing that it's very specific to application and to pulse type. So I just wanted to pull out some of our uh, qual spaghetti quality data. So this is specifically for the green lentil flowers. Um, and you can really see the difference that micronization had on the quality. So you see a much lower cooking time, a much higher cooking loss. And this is probably likely due to that starch damage. It's getting leaked into or leached into the cooking water. And then uh, a much lower cooked firmness, as I mentioned. But as I said, the germinated sample was uh, preferred for its less firm texture compared to the untreated. You can see it's very close to the cooked firmness of our semolina reference, our 100% uh, semolina pasta. Um, so that's probably why as uh, the firmness is a little bit Usually the firmness for pulse spaghetti is uh, a little bit too firm for most uh, people. So to summarize this activity, uh, the micronized flowers had high amounts of starch damage, which impacted their functionality. The germinated flowers had good baking properties, but an unacceptable flavor. Uh, but the green lentil and yellow pea germinated flowers performed well in the spaghetti application. Um, and the roasted flowers were expect acceptable in both applications, except for the yellow pea, um, just because of its flavor challenges. So the last activity is looking at the effect of extrusion as a post-treatment. So we took the street grape flowers that we produced from our pilot roller mill for green lentil, yellow pea, and navy bean, and heat treated them through our twin screw extruder. Uh, chickpea is not included here because of its sticky nature. Uh, it just, there was a real challenge to try and get it to flow through the extruder properly, so we were unable to process it. 
Uh, so we used the twin screw extruder. Uh, the barrel temperature was 140 degrees and we uh, added 10% water to the flour. We used a conveying screw for this activity. Um, this is different, a different screw configuration than what we would typically use to create a puffed product. Um, and the reason why we did this was because we didn't, we just wanted to heat treat the flour. And so the product coming out of the barrel, we wanted to stay as a flour consistency and not, uh, not get a puff uh, product at the end. Uh, this would also reduce the amount of starch damage that occurs, um, which we, we wanted to make sure that we didn't uh, have 20% starch damage again, as we saw that with the micronized samples, it just wasn't working well. After we extruded them, we remilled them using the uh, Bueller Lab roller mill. Uh, this was done just because there was some clumping that occurred, so we needed to make sure that the particle size was more consistent. So there was an effect on starch damage and water hydration capacity. The extruded flowers for each pulse type had a higher starch damage and a higher uh, water hydration capacity. Um, this increase in starch damage was really what we were, we were targeting. Um, we didn't want to have large amounts of starch damage as we know that that didn't work great in the applications that we were planning for. We also looked at the starch pacing profiles. For this activity, we had the opportunity to test these on a high temperature RVA. So we used a 140 degree uh, Celsius uh, starch pacing profile. So, uh, the, and we did that just because it was giving us better uh, discrimination between the untreated and extruded flowers so we could see uh, more differences. So for each of the pulse types, the extruded sample peaked earlier than the untreated sample. Um, this could be because of that slight increase in starch damage, because um, the, start, the damaged starch granules will uh, uptake that water more, more readily. So the particle size distribution between these two flower, the two flower treatments uh, didn't matter, didn't change too much. Um, the extruded flowers did have a slightly more large particles, likely due to that clumping that then need to, needed to get remilled. Um, and again, that remilling re uh, shrunk the uh, span of the distribution, so the the flowers were more consistent with the extruded treatment. So we also use these in our end product applications. Um, again, we use them at 20% inclusion for bread. You can see the extruded treatment decreased the loaf volume. The crumbs are, the crumb structure is a little bit more open uh, and uh, coarse, and uh, the color is a little bit more creamy and yellow. Uh, Flavor-wise, uh, both yellow pea sam samples were unacceptable. The only one that really showed an improvement was the extruded navy bean, where the flavor was seemed seemed more neutral, um, but there was no difference uh, noted between the green lentil the green lentil uh, samples. So again, we use them in uh, spaghetti, and. Uh, Again, we saw a lighter colored spaghetti with heat treatment. So each of the extruded samples showed a brighter, more yellow color uh, than compared to the untreated, uh, similar to what was seen in the previous activity. Um, the, in terms of uh, sensory, the uh, green lentil and navy bean, the extruded samples were preferred and they felt uh, because they had a less firm texture, a better appearance, and uh, they had slightly improved flavor compared to their untreated. So again, just to pull out some of the quality attributes for spaghetti, um, we see a higher cooking loss, in the extruded samples, likely because of that higher starch damage, and then the reduction in cooked firmness, which is actually a positive um, when in terms of 
uh, pulse uh, spaghetti because the untreated ones are really uh, slightly too firm. So this slight reduction in firmness was seen as a positive. So to uh, sum up this activity, the extruded flowers increased starch damage and water hydration capacity. Starch pacing properties of extruded flowers were modified. Uh, they saw, we saw an earlier peak, peak time for each pulse type. The breads made with extruded flowers had a lower specific volume, a more open crumb structure and creamier color. And the spaghetti made with the uh, extruded flowers were brighter, more yellow and uh, had a significantly softer texture. So just to uh, point out some takeaways from all of everything that I've talked about today, uh, roller milling uh, was a good way to produce a good high quality flour and the scouring separated the hull uh, from, the, from the flour well. Uh, Roller milling also creates the potential to create a wider variety of pulse, and pulse flower ingredients with those different flower streams. For pretreatments, micronization of pulse flowers really did not work well in the pasta and bread applications we tested due to the high starch damage. However, that's not to say that they wouldn't work well in a different application. Uh, the roasting and germination treatments had varying results depending on pulse type and application. And then finally, for the extrusion treatment, uh, extru the extrusion treatment modified the pulse pasting properties of the pulse, pulse flowers, and the extruded flowers performed well in the spaghetti applications. So I thank you for, oh, I got a, one more slide. <laughs> um, I really want to acknowledge our funding partners. So our funding from the Canadian Agricultural Partnerships Agri-Science Program. Um, I also want to thank uh, our my colleagues at Cereals Canada for all of their help um, and technical support running this project. And also thank InfraReady Products, uh, Saskatchewan Food Industry Development Centre and the Canadian Green Commission. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Lindsay. Really nice presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions for Lindsay? You can feel free to uh, write it in the chat or uh, raise your hand or. Oh, I see a hand somewhere. Maybe not. Oh, Adam. Hi, Adam. Hey, uh, great presentation. Uh, what a breadth of information on, on milling. Um, if I may, I wanted to ask, uh, why might there be a color change in pasta um, on the extruded treatment? So extruded flour versus untreated. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, don't, I don't really know the answer. It was a very big surprise to us um, that we saw that. Um, my one theory, uh, and I couldn't find any literature on uh, anybody else who had stated that they saw that change in a heat treated pasta. Um, but my one theory was that um, lots of the browning reactions happen from the Maillard reaction during the pasta drying. And I wondered if some of those, um, some of those reagents and um, things that, uh, they need the flowers need to create those color reactions during the Maillard reaction um, were just used up from the previous heat treatments um, and they're just not not browning anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a good question and I'm, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Uh, if I may follow up, does, mm -hmm. does that mean was there any sweetness difference in the pasta? Can you taste sweetness in pasta? Is that a thing? Uh, well, you can, um, but there was nothing that we picked up or noted uh, significantly um, in the sweetness. Uh, and then if I may, just one more question. Uh, sure. Is there a difference um, noted after cooking in terms of um, color? So if it was cooked, does it lose color? Like, does it become lighter when it's cooked? Yeah, so typically you'll see like the, all the pictures I showed was dried spaghetti. So, I mean, the same thing that when you cook 
wheat spaghetti at home that it, it isn't quite as vibrant yellow, you'll see a color change similar to that um, with pulse pasta. Um, so it'll kind of lighten, become a little bit less yellow in color. Um, so you get that effect. We didn't measure the color of the cooked spaghetti, but you could tell the differences um, between them. Like the ones that were heat treated, you could tell were lighter and brighter even after cooking compared to the untreated sample. Good to know. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah. Does anyone have any other questions? Uh, I, maybe I'll have one, Lindsay, while people sure. are, are thinking about it. So, um, you know, in the scale up trial, you know, you had roasting and micronization and germination. Um, wh why do you think uh, uh, the the micro, um, there's so much more damaged starch and micronized versus roasting? Because both it is a, you know, pretty good heat treatment, right? Yeah. Um... I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure if the um, micronization is just getting more into the seed, whereas roasting is maybe more on the surface and more of like a drying effect. Um, also, I wondered if, because some starch damage would be coming from the mill process as well. So I wondered if there was significant changes to the seed itself from micronization that caused some changes um, from during milling to make it more susceptible to starch damage. Um, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, does anyone, we have time for, oh. Yeah. Can I ask the question? Um, sure. Link say, sorry to join a little bit late, but uh, I missed the part about the micronization technique. Um, I also am wondering, would you describe that technique a little bit? So you mentioned that this might impact uh, starch more, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, we also observed some protein <laughs> change in that technology. Could you explain a little bit to me? <laughs> I, I'm no micronization expert, that's for sure. Um, we did get it done at InfraReady, um, but just it being an infrared heat treatment, I, it's just different, right, than a, a like putting things in the oven, um, but I don't. I don't think I would be able to speak to what's specifically happening with the infrared heat hitting the the seed um, and what changes could happen there. Just because I I don't have that background knowledge on that specific treatment. Uh, Ling, uh, just to follow up, because uh, some of our students did the uh, um, infrared heating at, at infrared. Uh, so basically, um, they looked at different moisture contents. 20 and 30 percent in terms of tempering so we added some moisture and then we looked at different uh, surface temp temperatures uh, i think it was 120 and 140 degrees celsius though in the machine they can control the speed of the conveyor belt that that drives the seed to change the exposure to the infrared rays to control surface temperature uh, th then they measure it uh, through there so uh, how infrared, as you know, works, it, it penetrates the seed. It's really a surface treatment. It causes the water my molecules to vibrate to generate heat. Uh, and we see changes in both protein and starch in terms of gelatinization and uh, uh, changes in the structure of the protein as well during the process. Um, can I ask another question? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I think um, in the characterizations, um, we see their um, starch get characterized. Have you have any characterizations regarding the protein uh, structure change? Because I'm I'm protein scientist, so <laughs> any I, any work there? <laughs> um, no, we didn't do any characterization of um, protein. I know um, Dr. House's group is doing some protein digestibility work um, on these samples, so. I mean, feel free to reach out to them because um, they're they're part of this 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 study. So we're we supplied them with um, samples from all of these different treatments. So uh, they they would be the ones to speak more on the the protein. I don't know if Mike has anything to add to because he's part of it as well. Um, but yeah, they would be the ones to speak to about the protein specifically. 
It, yeah, no, Jim did all the, the protein quality work. And, and I'll put Adam on the spot because uh, he's really <laughs> excited about this. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lindsay. And thank you, Mike, for your addition <laughs> comments. <laughs> I like to pass a buck. Adam's hiding still. Sure, yeah, I can I can comment. So you just want to know if there's differences in the protein quality of the products or the flowers? Was that the question? Yeah, you asked me, oh, Adam, um, <laughs> um, I'm wondering any any change in terms of the protein structure after those pre-processing um, work or after processing work? So, uh, I'm currently in the process of analyzing some chickpea in terms of protein structure. Um, so that I'll speak a little more to, so there's some interest in that. If, if there's change in structure um, in, uh, in secondary structure, then we might see changes in digestibility. Uh, but our digestibility work is saying that more or less the products are all even in terms of digestibility. There's, maybe there's like a 3% difference between some products, right? Um, that, that information I haven't put out there yet, but, um, and then in terms of quality, um, that is still in the works. So I actually just got that information today. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I couldn't tell you, but um, in our previous works, um, there was some uh, small differences in, in, in quality. And that's mostly because of losses in, um, in an essential amino acid. It would either be tryptophan or, uh, or methionine and cysteine. Um, uh, but those were in the raw flowers. So if, if we're more interested in the products, I would take it back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. <laughs> I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so with, with that, it is uh, four o'clock. Uh, you know, thank you, Lindsay. It was a really nice uh, presentation. And I know uh, a lot of people enjoyed it. Um, so again, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone coming and uh, we'll see you at the next seminar. Great, thanks Mike. Thanks, bye everyone.